I mean, through history and th through American history, you know, we've always had presidents who bring people together by inspiring them and who, who make inspiring, unifying speeches. I mean, you know, I mean, you can talk about Lincoln, you can talk about Obama, you can talk about, um, you know, Eisenhower, FDR. I mean, there it is, it's not it was an it's a nonpartisan skill. Both Democrats and Republicans have been able to do it in the past. Reagan, of course, if, if they can just get an inspiring, thoughtful speech down to a 15 second TikTok with some sexy editing <laughs> uh, and lean towards moderation, our democracy is going to be fine. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Okay. Hey, Jordan, good to be back. Listen, um, there's a lot of politics. We're going to have a chance to get into some of that with our guest. But I, I cannot believe that starting this week, football's back, the NFL. I mean, I mean, can you, I mean, don't we get a break? I guess it must be all about money. Is that, what's, what no, drives this? I mean, no. we, you know, 16 games and all these, uh, all these preseason games. Do you ever get tired of it? This is, well, I mean, I do think money, you don't, you don't need to go much farther than that. I think money is probably it. I It is exhausting. I, I have the I have the energy for about a fandom for four months of the year. And so all my energy goes towards college football. And then as we've talked about, some NBA when that gets going. And everything else is sort of, if I'm around, if I got time, NFL, okay, I guess I'll, I guess I'll watch some of it. Truthfully, I'm a college man, you know, that's that's my tribalistic instincts. Give me the Wolverines. Give me the drama. Give me a coach who's camping out uh, in trees trying to recruit people. That's <laughs> that's that's my fan base right there. And how, how are you feeling about the upcoming uh, Wolverines vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ohio State? I'll I'll pine a little bit about Ohio State. But what, what do you think about the, how they're going to do? I think, you know, you, you never know a ton preseason wise. I think the team looks strong this year. I think they had a great year last year one of the best we've had in a couple decades um you know ohio state couldn't beat us last year i don't think they'll beat us this year so i'm feeling pretty good going into okay, it all okay okay now there we go so <laughs> how about how about what, how much do we want to bet on that game do you want to bet five bucks five that's, bucks that's steep for me is that really high i mean i'm saying we could even double it we could double we could make it a ten dollar bet all right let's go ten dollars uh flat out even uh, they're playing i think they're playing at ohio state this year uh -huh. And Ohio State looks very, very strong. I mean, it looks awesome. But, but you know, remember we had Costas on and we were talking about NIL. And how about the money these these players are getting? I mean, they're even getting people who were in high school, apparently, are signing NILs and, uh, and re reaping rewards. I mean, what do you think this is changing the game? Sure. I mean, I, th I think it's, it's, a, it's totally going to change the game. I, you know, I think... Change is the one constant we have, and I, I I don't know if you were ever going to keep it the way it was. Um, yeah, kids are. I mean, it's the, the money these colleges are making, the video games these kids are playing, the characters they become uh, in the world of social media. I understand that it's a big business. If you can make a living being a uh, a shit posting TikToker at age fourteen. Well, if you're pretty good at playing football, maybe you can make a little living at seventeen. So I I'm not gonna hate at it, but it's it's changing. What are yeah, you going to do? Yeah. So, you know, you live right there in New York. So the big news today for those who are baseball fans is it looks like the Mets are coming on. And uh, the Yankees kind of stumbling. I, I saw a little bit of headlines in the sports uh, on television today. It looks as though you it is a possibility of a Subway series. So the question is, are you getting me any ticks? <laughs> Am I getting you tickets? Yeah. Oh, I. Oh, I mean, when we go, is... what do you think about that? You know what? It sounds exciting, but then when I imagine the length of a baseball game is, I think last time I checked, six and a half hours. So you and me, six and a half hours. Yeah. This podcast is already long enough. Coming. You know do you what? Want, you do know you really what? want us to bicker for six and a half hours you know what? at a baseball uh, game? I would. I would say that. Uh, yeah, we we probably wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't we wouldn't make it unless we were drinking <laughs> drinking a lot. That's this the is only it. Way. We would get, I don't. You know, we had to see how the red wine situation is at Yankee Stadium. I'd get yeah. some bourbons, and you yeah. know, you know, maybe we'd it hash might it not out. be a bad idea. It you know, might I, not be a bad idea. You know what? I was quick to judge. Maybe this is where we, that elusive common ground, it might be found in the eighth inning, uh, four drinks deep uh, with uh, with judge up to bat. Maybe maybe that's where it lies. Boy, can that guy, can that guy hit. Now, Jordan, at some point, um, I'm not going to press you on it today. we got to give it a little bit of time. 
But we're going to have to have some predictions here about these midterms, you know, mm -hmm. what, what we expect is going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I want you to think hard about what you what predictions you want to make, because I'm going to hold you your prediction. All right. Uh, uh, Governor, I'm excited about our guest today. Our guest this week is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, bestselling author and journalist covering geopolitics and foreign policy. She's currently a staff writer for The Atlantic and her newest bestseller, Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism is available now. And Applebaum, it's an honor to have you on, Anne. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. The twilight of democracy. You saw it coming, huh? This is, it feels like you really struck a nerve. And uh, every, I, I feel like I continue to read Ann Applebaum articles as they are sent to me, as I'm going to Hungary. I literally went to Hungary a few months ago with just a stack of all of your words, trying to educate myself quickly. You are, you, you are feeding me knowledge and I thank you for it. <laughs> Thank you. I actually wanted no. no I so so I ha I happen to write about a part of the world that in which I watched the democ decline, democracy decline, and it turned out to be more relevant to U.S. politics than I thought it would be. Yeah. Well, I wanted to actually jump in and talk a little bit about that. Like I said, I was I was I was in Hungary recently, and you've written about it. Um, in fact, Viktor Orban is coming to CPAC this week. And he's he's not coming to D.C. to talk to Biden. He's coming to CPAC to talk to the conservatives of America. Um, and I'm curious from your perspective, what is it that uh, American conservatives see in Viktor Orban? How much of it has to do with the cultural issues that he's he's talking about and how much has to do with the effectiveness he has with uh, holding on to power? So you've, you've actually pinpointed the two things that I think they admire in Orban. Um, one of them is the fact that he's been in office for so long. Uh, how has he remained in, so office for, in office for so long is by changing the rules of his political system. I mean, in his case, he was able to manipulate the Hungarian constitution, constantly reforming it and rewriting it. Um, he's engaged in a form of gerrymandering. Um, he's got m mostly control of his judiciary, so he can personally avoid um, any investigations, deep investigations into corruption. He's also got hold of the media in Hungary, so there isn't really any, there's certainly no newspapers and no major television channels that belong to anybody who's not either the government or a, or a business leader close to the government. Um, and that's a model of illiberalism, a form of taking over the state, a form of changing the electoral rules that I think some people in the modern Republican Party uh, admire. Um, I, wouldn't, I won't say all the Republican Party, but there's clearly a part of it that does. And then I think the second thing they admire about him is that one of the ways he has done this and has, in, in effect, covered up doing this is by fighting a perpetual culture war. So... He doesn't talk too much about ordinary life. He doesn't necessarily deal with the problems that Hungarians face. Um, he doesn't um, advertise the fact that he's undermining Hungarian democracy. Instead, he focuses relentlessly on cultural enemies. And in his case, that's um, LGBT. He would describe it as a lobby, but he, he focuses on, um, you know, the, the academic studies of, of 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 uh, gay and lesbian issues. Um, he focuses on um, the threat that he says George Soros, and who is a symbol for international Judaism, um, poses to the Hungarian nation. Um, and he, he also promotes a form of the replacement theory. In other words, that um, there's a secret plot to replace Hungarians with brown people, Muslims from other places. And George Soros, in fact, is the person who's mainly responsible for this plot. And so he focuses people on things they're afraid of, things they're scared of. Um, and he keeps the conference, he, he kind of keeps raising the level of shock and anger. Um, and this is how he does politics in Hungary. And this is also a model of doing politics that I think some people in the Republican Party also admire. And why do you think uh, authoritarianism is seductive? Because you've written that you you say that it's seductive. What what what's your sense of why? What makes it that way? 
In, in some ways, it's the default position of humanity. If you look back over human history, over time, most governments or most political systems, most states have been authoritarian. Um, I think authoritarianism uh, answers a need that some people have for security. And also, at a time when there is an enormous amount of information, enormous amount of argument online and in real life, authoritarianism offers a, a single unified answer to questions and a way of silencing all those arguments. And if you are the kind of person who's bothered by conflict, whether it's violent conflict or, or, or um, verbal conflict, then authoritarianism seems to be an answer. You know, I often hear people say, usually they're talking about China, but they say, well, you know, at least authoritarians, they can plan things better. At least they have a longer term perspective. At least they can they can have unified answers to questions. They're not always arguing with their opponents. Um, and people, of course, forget that most authoritarianisms, most authoritarian countries look a lot more like Zimbabwe um, or, you know, Eritrea than they look like um, than they look like China. And of course, even China, once you get down into the nitty gritty of how China is actually governed, you would find an enormous amount of discontent and unhappiness with the way decisions are made there. Um, exhibit A being the catastrophic COVID policy, both at the very beginning when they tried to cover it up and more recently when they locked people up in order to prevent anybody from getting it. But for, for, for days and days and weeks and weeks, people were shut inside their houses. Um, so, but, but nevertheless, the idea, the image or the myth that somehow the Chinese do things better, they're more efficient, they're better than us, is something that people find appealing. And also the idea that, you know, if we didn't have all this squabbling here in America, we would get things done in a more efficient way. So let's just go back for a second, because uh, when you say it's sort of the default position, but throughout history also, has been a yearning to overthrow the yoke of the people who were in charge. I mean, if we go back and study, uh, you know, the history of, uh, of Israel uh, throughout the very beginning of time, really, there was always an effort by uh, Israelites, uh, Jews, to be able to free themselves from the yoke of their impress oppressors. When we look at the total glee and uh, unbelievable uh, celebrations that occurred with the collapse of the wall, you know, in Berlin, um, when we look at Venezuela today, or we look at at Russia today, and we think about the work of people like Navalny, it seems to me as though there is a yearning inside of every individual to be free from oppressors. But oppressors can be, as I think you point out, vicious, right? I, I completely agree with you. I mean, I, by default, I said I meant that mo most, as I said, most political regimes going back, if you go back several thousand sure. years, that's what you find. Yeah. But you also find this drive that has been there for just as long for independence, for freedom from authority, and also for justice, for the rule of law, yeah. um, to live in a political system where um, you have some rights and where the law is not just what a powerful person says it is, but it has some independent status. I mean, you see this, you're right, it's just as ancient and just as old. Um, I've just come back from Ukraine where I spent a lot of time on this trip in Odessa and a little bit in Kiev with people who are working as volunteers on behalf of the army or on behalf of refugees who are giving their time, who are organizing crowdfunding, who are trying to help win the war. And all of those people, and there are thousands of them, are m motivated by exactly what you describe. You know, this belief that if they remain Ukrainian, they will be they will be inside a democracy, they will have rights, they won't live. In, it's the desire not to be an autocratic state. And this for them is really life and death. And But you're right, you see it in Venezuela, you see it in Cuba, you see it in Burma, you see it in Nicaragua, yeah, you see it also in China. Yeah. And China with the Uyghurs, you know. With, you know the, not just yeah. the Uyghurs, the Hong Kong Chinese, yeah, um, right. mainstream China, yeah. mainland Chinese, there are lots and there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, it's not a, it's not easy to be a Democrat in China. And there's an enormous huh. amount of pressure okay. now pushing back against it. But, but you're right. I mean, it's interesting in, in your book, Twilight of Democracy, 
uh, you grapple with some of these ideas of watching people uh, lean towards authoritarianism, uh, somewhat of a slide, even friends towards uh, fascism, and pointing to this idea that uh, a lot of it is rooted in humiliation and resentment on a personal level. Can you expand on that? So I think the I think there is in many Western democracies, many established democracies, there is a many people have a sense of personal disappointment, and sometimes. It's ideological disappointment. This isn't the country that I thought it was. You know, whether you're a Pole who thought that the political transition would be different or an American mm -hmm. who remembers a time or think you remember a time when things were easier or simpler. Um, and sometimes it, that's accompanied by personal disappointment. You know, I didn't have the political career that I wanted to have or that I deserved to have. Or, um, and and therefore the choice of a political alternative, it, you know, can be both personal and political. It's also very um, hard to pick apart the human brain. I mean, people have motives that involve their own careers and are also ideological or, um, you know, or religious or, you know, they people have many motives at once. But I think if you use the word disappointment and you talk about people being disappointed with the status quo, disappointed with the establishment, then you begin to get to some of the explanation for the phenomenon that we've seen. Do you think actually, that's an interesting focus there. Do you think specifically in the American conversation around, I feel like there's been a million op-eds trying to grapple with this current moment and watching people with these certain leanings. Is there is there too much attempting to put it on things like religion and ideology when they should be focusing on something as simple as just basic human disappointment? I think I think if you focus on disappointment and also if you focus on this this thing I referred to before, which is cacophony, you know, the the noise of contemporary life and the speed of change, um, which not everybody is g good at dealing with. I think I mean, I, that's also related to economics and education and other things. But if you if you think about the the. the you know, the, the amount that people have had to absorb, you know, sociological change, demographic change, economic change, informational change, um, just over the last 10 years, you know, let alone the past 20 years, um, you, you know, you, f you find that people have developed a kind of nostalgia for something else. You know, they're disappointed with the nature of contemporary life. And they, you know, imagine that if you go back to something earlier, or you go back to another time, it will be better. And I, I think that's, that's often at the root of, um, you know, whatever ideology people put on top of it. We'll be right back. And now back to the show. And I, I'm a, I think it's uh, at the root of it is maybe even something more basic. And that is, and I found it out back in the days when I was running for president. I think people feel like they don't matter, that the cards are stacked against them. I mean, in their own lives, they're not seeing the kind of wealth growth or, you know, this whole issue of the growing divide between the rich and the poor. And that rich guy gets all this and I don't get anything. And I'm living in a community where, you know, it's there's opiates and I and I can't control that. And 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 by the way, I see the politicians, you know, they get away with murder and I get nothing and they get, you know, sky high Social Security retirement benefits. And I've, they've taken all mine away. Um I think it's a, it's a sense that people feel both lonely and the fact that cards have been stacked against us. And I think you got a guy running for president who says John McCain's not a hero because he got caught. <laughs> and you say, how does a guy get elected when he says something like that? But it, it brought me back to the point where it seemed as though Donald Trump or any of these other people are just in the game of monopolies just spilled over the board. And people are like, yeah, I'm tired of this. I'm not going to play this game anymore because I can never win. It's all stacked against me. And if you look around the world, it's the threat to me of, of the growth of democracy. You look at the ouster of Boris Johnson. People felt, you know, here's this guy partying over there at uh, in his place and, and hanging out all over the world. And I, here I am struggling to make ends meet. And I, any, I think that the the underpinning of democracy, it, if you want to stabilize it, I think it gets down to being able to tell people that I care about you, that you're in the game, that you're not ignored, that another group of people don't get all the benefits. And when people get a sense that they're removed from that, then I think they begin to lose their support and they begin to think about, well, who's going to come in and fix it? That's, that's what I th think 
is a, is a big issue, uh, not only in our country, but in the Western world right now. I, I agree with you. And, you know, democracy has always been about being able to throw out the people in power. Yeah. And, you know, in a way, you know, we use this word populism a lot, but in a way, almost every election has a populist element. I mean, somebody is saying the guys in power are bad and, you know, they're a corrupt elite and we're going to take over and throw them out. The, the difference in the last um, several years has been adding to that a sense that it's not just the people in power who I want out. It's the whole system that I want yeah. out. Exactly. That I don't trust the system. I don't yeah. believe the system is going to produce people who will ever think about people like me. Um, and that's exactly, you're, you pinpointed exactly Big labor, why big business, big sports, all of it has that resonance. You know, my view is that it's all connected. The bigness means I'm kind of lost. And the speed of change, which you point out, the speed of people feel like, well, wait a minute, I don't even, I don't, what do I grab onto? I think that's, a yeah, big and chunk I think, of I think it. It's, and as I said, I think it's coupled with a sense that things used to be different or the world used to be a better place for people like me. Yeah. And now people like me don't have a place in it. And that's also why, for example, this replacement theory, this conspiracy theory about white people being replaced by other people is so powerful because it echoes something that as you say, people feel that the the world isn't made for me anymore. What, what do you see as some of these dangers we have? Specifically, Orban comes to CPAC, he's put on this pedestal, and just recently he made news for um, talking about Hungary being a place where they didn't want mixed races. Uh, and that caused such a stir there that even an aide of his stepped down, uh, calling it a pure Nazi text. And uh, I understand and I think it's important for Americans to look at places like Hungary. And Hungary is a different ecosystem than than America, and it, it very much also has different ideals. Uh, but I would argue that like the American ideal is one of a, of a melting pot, is one of uh, people coming from afar, coming together. And they may be in, in some ways different than what Hungarians see themselves as or as some Hungarians see themselves as. Is there a danger or what do you see as the dangers of uh uh, a, a Republican Party looking at Orban and either choosing to look away from some of these darker comments that he makes uh, that seem to be antithetical to the American identity? Uh, or is this just saying the quiet part out loud? I think, unfortunately, it's saying the quiet part out loud. I mean, that Orban thought like that has been clear for a long time. And by the way, the word he used, he talked about it, he doesn't want mixed races. He actually used a word that's closer to species, you know, as if humans were incompatible with one another. Um, and I, I think the, as I said, the idea that my kind of person is being replaced and is disappearing is something that, again, a piece of the Republican Party, the Trumpist wing of the Republican Party, also sees as a powerful conspiracy theory that can motivate people. Um, and um, it's, it, you know, of course it's racist, um, but it's something even deeper than that. I mean, it's it's racist plus, you know, as I said, it's connected to this sense of despair, and that's why it's working so well right now. Um, and I agree with you; it's 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 absolutely in opposition to everything that America is and always has been. I mean, it's always been a place where people, you know, we used to talk about people being Irish and Italian, you know, and Polish as those people being also culturally incompatible, but then it turned out that they were. Um, and so we, we've had this argument going on in America for a long time about whether new kinds or different kinds of people can fit in. Um, and invent, you know, invariably they always do. Um, you, know, you know, in Hungary, the, the language is particularly nasty because there is something like, a, there isn't that tradition and so it's clear that what Orban is talking about is both he's he's both echoing old anti-Semitic language and he's also um, echoing modern racist language. I mean, all of which is totally inappropriate for the United States, which has never had a um, anything like a you know blood and soil national identity the way the Hungarians have it. Um, but as I say, there's a piece of now the Republican right that sees that as a useful kind of a useful conspiracy theory or a useful set of anxieties to hook on to because it matches some things they they have they want to encourage in the United States. You know, a bit, let, let's just be fair about this and let's just talk about the the Democrat, liberal left-wing Democrat 
who went and admired Fidel Castro and thought he mm-hmm. was a great leader, or mm-hmm. Hugo Chavez in, in, in Venezuela, they basically destroyed that country right now. And mm-hmm. I was in Congress at the time when we had a bunch of left-wingers that thought the Sandinistas were great. And you know what's happening in Nicaragua and, and what they have done to, to just destroy uh, anybody that's in disagreement with them. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just that both sides have a tendency to play with fire when it comes to extremism. The issue is, where's the middle? You know, does the middle buy in into this kind of stuff? Although is that would, you, would you agree that it is is and is it a both sides issue right now? It feels like, from my perspective, I understand that both sides at at times will play into it, but it feels as though the danger is coming from one side specifically. So, um, what Governor Casey? I mean, certainly, what you're talking about is certainly true. There was in the past a left wing attraction to a form of liberalism or a form of autocracy, which was at that time communism. Right. You know, I've written extensively about that. I've written several books about communism in which I talk about this exact, exact um, phenomenon. Um, you know, at, at the moment, there is a much smaller part of the left, and it's not part of yeah. the Democratic Party so much. It's not, we're not talking I about very many congressional Democrats yeah. um, who also, um, espouse a form of liberalism. I mean, it's not so much pro-communist anymore. It's about other things. I mean, I think we, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, rigid definitions that can't be crossed about identity and so on. But I, and I, and they are, a, in some contexts, that way of thinking is problematic, for example, at universities, but, um, but I don't think it's the political problem that the illiberal right now represents. I mean, there is actually a piece of our mainstream political, one of our mainstream political parties that is avowedly and openly illiberal, meaning that it's anti-democratic and it wants to change the nature of the American state, change the voting system, change the way we do things. Um, And I don't see that matched by a similar, right now, by a similar movement inside the congressional or political Democratic Party. Everything has its changes. Everything has a pendulum. And it's just like the pendulum that affects uh, democracy or authoritarianism. Right now, because I think the leadership in the Democratic societies have not responded to the fact that people have been so dissatisfied and feel as though they've been left alone, has gone the wrong way, and now we look at China and say, oh, well, look, they're because they have a dictator, they're able to just make decisions easier. That will change. Over time, that will change because it, the, the pendulum always swings one way or another. And now people are beginning, and I kind of look at what's happening in China. At one point, we couldn't, we couldn't say enough good about China. Now we can't say enough bad about China. It's a swinging pendulum, and things pendulums tend to find their, you know, their, uh, their balances. And uh, the hack fact that they're going to invite this Orban over here, that guy's a terrible guy, just terrible. And the fact that he's going to go speak at, at CPAC, but, you know, again, CPAC is like some extreme kind of thing now. It didn't used to be, but it's gotten more and more extreme. But I would say that both sides have had a tendency at times to play with people who didn't represent the kind of fundamental um, – sense of democracy. And your your point is well taken, and Jordan's point is, is well taken. If I could just spend a second, and you, you spent a lot of time in the Soviet Union. Tell people what you found when you were over there about the nature of what happens in a, uh, in a, a totalitarian regime. So I spent a lot of time writing about the Soviet Union, and I did spend a summer um, in the Soviet Union as a student um, I should be clear that it was a long time ago. Um, Soviet Union has been gone since 1991. Right. I know. Um, but I can certainly talk about the nature of the system. I mean, the, the, the primary thing I remember about living there, um, this is in about 1984, I think, 84, 85. The primary thing I can remember about living there was this palpable sense of fear. So people were afraid of one another. They were afraid of what they could say to one another. Um, I remember as a foreigner... If I stopped on the street to ask somebody for directions, they would freeze up, you know, who, because obviously I had an, I spoke Russian, but I have an accent. And so, you know, not everybody would want to talk to a foreigner because that could get them in trouble. That's that's just a tiny example 
of of what it was like. Um, you know, people met privately, you know, in kitchens or in their apartments in order to have real conversations. Nobody had a nobody spoke honestly in public. Um, and there is a sense of constant restraint and anxiety um, that I think, by the way, has an echo even now in contemporary Russia. I mean, you can hear the um, the you know as as the Putin regime has grown harsher, people almost it's almost as if people revert back to what they remember or what their parents described to them. You know, people are automatically afraid again, um, and so there is this this atmosphere of fear. I mean. From from reading and working in history, I know how it became like that. So the the Soviet Union um, and and the and the Soviet satellite states had very clear policies that were designed, for example, you know. So there was a there was full government control over all kinds of institutions, party control, I should say. The Communist Party controlled um, not just the state and not just politics, but also all major. You know, economic institutions, factories, warehouses, uh, all major educational institutions, universities, schools, after school programs, kindergartens, um, and they controlled the, obviously the judiciary, the prosecution service. I mean, everything was essentially controlled by one small group of people who could then manipulate it in order to remain in power. And the other important aspect of it, um, and this has an important contemporary echo, is they also sought to control everything that we now call civil society. So everything from sports clubs to chess clubs to, um, I don't know, amateur bird watching groups, you know, and then obviously including political groups and, and societies and organizations. So everything independent was somehow connected, was supposed to be somehow connected to the Communist Party or controlled. And that sense that you, there's no outlet, there's no, you know, there's no intellectual alternative. There's no way to be active in your life except by being part of the party and part of the state is is what created this atmosphere, this kind of suffocating atmosphere. Um, also, it was very and a, and a very cynical atmosphere, you know, so if you don't own anything and you don't and you can't progress except by paying homage to the party, then people become very cynical about everything, about education, about uh, about their jobs. Um, there used to be a saying, you know, they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work, you know, that, you know, why should, you know, if you're working for a government institution and you know that, um, you know, you, you, you have a sense of it, nothing, nothing you do mattering, then why should you try very hard? So it had all kinds of negative effects on people. It, it, it was created fear. It destroyed creativity. Um, it undermined any sense of entrepreneurship. I mean, it was a genuinely evil political system. Um, in 2015, you said we're not yet in a new Cold War. I'm wondering how you would classify current international relations with Russia. So I, I would actually I would say that it's the, the the current international relations is not just important you know it's not just Russia Russia has has gone backwards very fast towards an old Soviet model which is of course the model that Putin remembers that he grew up with um, I would say that there is something else happening though aside from our obvious direct conflict with Putin and Putinism which is that a number of other countries including China including Iran including Venezuela. Um, have also they they these are countries that aren't all the same. They're not part of a bloc the way there was a Soviet bloc. They're not unified by some, you know, by some institution or even by some secret meeting. They don't all meet one another like in a James Bond movie somewhere and make decisions. Um, and they have very they have very different ideologies. You're talking about Chinese communism or Iranian theocracy or Venezuelan chavismo. You know, these are different systems. Um, but we are now facing a world where there are a number of very powerful states, and Venezuela is powerful in the Latin American context. Um, there are a number of very powerful states that have as their central interest the 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 destruction of or the resistance to liberal democracy. In fact, the resistance to exactly that um, desire for freedom that Governor Kasich described a few minutes ago. So, so what does Russia see as its main, what does Putin see really, I should say, not Russia, what does Putin see as the, the main threat to his form of autocratic, kleptocratic power? The main thing he sees 
is the power of spontaneous social organization. Um, the, the, the numbers of people in Russia who would like a freer and more just system. I mean, forget about democracy, talk about justice. Um, why is he at war with Ukraine? Partly because the Ukrainians tried to create such a system. They tried to create a, you know, a Slavic democracy, um, in which they would have sovereignty and autonomy and there would be some kind of rule of law and there would be some way of having public conversations and arguments. That's one of the things that Putin hates about Ukraine. Um, it's also what the Chinese hated about the Hong Kong um, demonstrations that were crushed a few years ago. You know, it's what the Venezuelan leadership hates about the Venezuelan opposition. Um, so these are states which, as I said, they don't share everything, but they do have this common enemy. Um, and they identify it both within their own countries and they also identify it with us um, in America, in, in Europe, um, in other democracies, actually in other dem democracies, world, Taiwan, um, other democracies around the world. Um, and so it's not that we're in a Cold War um, in the same way that we once were. It's we're but we are. But there is an ideological argument going on in the world and it's playing itself out in the war in Ukraine. To some extent, it's playing itself out within the United States, um, and you can also see it within a number of European countries as well, and also and and Asian countries. And when you take a look at the the savagery of the Russians in Ukraine, um, well, the, the two things: one is why does the world, why does so much of the world, choose to remain on the sidelines when pressed about uh, supporting the Ukrainians? Um, and number two, you you said that we looked the other way when the when Putin was engaged in activities that really we should have you know whether it's Crimea whether it's Chechnya uh, with some of the activity in Georgia. You say that we made a mistake by not looking at it and doing something about it. So I guess a two point question two part question is what what do you think we should have done about it? And secondly, when the world sits back and looks at the viciousness of the Russian activity, in, particularly in Ukraine, why does the world kind of – big chunks of the world look the other way? So those are great questions. I mean, the, the, the first one, you know, why didn't we do anything about it? There were two – I think two pieces of that. One of them was, um, you know, a refusal to – to change the status quo. So we had created after the Cold War a very comfortable, it was particularly comfortable for some European countries, a comfortable relationship with Russia, whereby, you know, we had a trading relationship with them. A number of countries got relatively cheap gas, cheap energy from Russia. Um, and the 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 sort of revolution that was necessary to realize that our trading relationship with Russia had in fact enhanced and encouraged the development of a Russian dictatorship um, and the realization that we were going to have to pay a huge cost to end this dependency has simply been an enormous political leap for many people and many leaders. Um, in the United States, there was a tendency starting with the Obama administration, really starting earlier, um, but to, to minimize the significance of Russia, you know, it's a regional power. It doesn't matter that much, you know, we have bigger fish to fry, we're more interested in Asia, what, you know, we're more interested in the Middle East, whatever it is. And the refusal to see that the um, growth in autocracy in Russia was going to require us to change our way of doing things, I think there was just a lot of resistance to that. You know, the people didn't like to change, you know, to pay a big political price or an economic price for that kind of realization. So there was a opposition to that, um, that, that made it made it difficult for us to see. And then, as I said, uh, uh, you know, moving to the next step, okay, what will we do about it? I think that, you know, what were the, what would the costs of that be? What would the impact be? I, I think there was just enormous, um, in, enormous resistance. And I think the other piece of it is, and this is related to the second part, is that we also didn't see, you know, the, you know, Russia, we, we kept treating Russia as this regional power. OK, they're, you know, they're not very nice to the Chechens. OK, they've decided to be involved sure. in Syria. Yeah. You know, what we didn't see was that in each one of those cases, Russia wasn't just fighting the Chechens and wasn't just fighting the Syrians. It was also making known its views about the laws of war, about human rights, um, about all kinds of um 
norms that we thought we had created in Europe and in the world after the Second World War. You know, they, Grozny, the city, you know, the, the capital city of Chechnya looked a lot like Mariupol does today. It was burned to the ground. You know, thousands of people were killed. You know, there was torture of political prisoners. You know, all this has happened. You know, Aleppo in Syria, um, same thing. Um, you know, and and the Russians each time each time they carried out an atrocity like that, they were waiting for us to react and say, you know, no, but you know, European norms, the UN values, whatever it was, and we did never reacted to it. Um, and we simply kept treating these things as side issues, as smaller places. We didn't see them as central yeah. as they are. Um, and I think you know when you ask why isn't the rest of the world reacting? I mean, I think a lot of the rest of the world still isn't hasn't faced that either. I mean, there's a the degree to which the Russian assault on Ukraine represents, for example, a real threat in Africa. You know, the idea that a large country can simply change its borders by invading and wiping out its neighbors is something that should frighten a lot of people in Africa or in Latin America or, or, or Asia or anywhere else. But people um, people are choosing not to see this as that kind of challenge. I mean, I think there's a sort of secondary piece of it, which is that many people in other parts of the world, again, particularly Africa and the Middle East, um, tend to have a have a already an inbuilt dislike or prejudice against the United States or against NATO. They say this is some kind of NATO Russia conflict. They don't want to be involved. I mean, I don't think I don't think you see a lot of active support for Russia. Um, certainly, you see none in Europe. Europe is amazingly united in its in its understanding of this war. And outside of Europe, you see a lot of neutrality, but you don't see lots of people saying "rah rah, go Russia, destroy mm -hmm. Ukraine." I mean, and and I think it's it's more a a kind of hands off, we don't want to be involved attitude rather than that. And I think the I think the argument is winnable. Actually, the French president Emmanuel Macron was in Africa um, last week, and has begun to make this argument. You know, do you understand what the significance of this war is? Um, and I would like to see U.S. politicians doing that too. We'll be right back. And now back to the show. I, it's interesting when I turn on TV right now. I'm no longer seeing images what's happening in Ukraine. I think Americans have a pretty short attention span. Uh, I, you know, we were we were seeing images and then suddenly we moved to stories on COVID, Roe v. Wade, the January 6th hearings. How much do you think the world's and especially America's ever fleeting attention span plays into Putin's plans? So Putin is certainly planning on America losing its attention. He's counting on that. He's also counting on, um, you know, a kind of cracks m m emerging in the relationship between America and Europe, as particularly Germans, but also Italians and others pay much higher prices for energy. You know, he's counting on the coalition that's been created to fight the war um, breaking up. I mean, I'm I'm a little bit less worried about attention spans in the U.S. Mm. You know, the, the, I mean, ha, as I said, having just come back from Ukraine myself, um, the the war is that it is genuinely difficult to describe and explain now. Um, after the you know really shocking events of of February and March, um, and I, I I do think that as it begins to change, there will be more coverage will return, I, I, and and I'm also convinced at least up until now that in Washington, in the, in certainly in Congress, and I hope also in the White House, there's a there's a longer term commitment to fighting the war and making sure that Ukraine remains a sovereign state. Um, and so I'm, you know, the fact that Americans aren't watching it on television all the time bothers me. Actually, the Ukrainians worry that Americans aren't watching it on television all the time, but I'm, I'm less worried about that. I, I feel that the, I don't feel that the, commitment to the war or the understanding of the war is changing. And I think for the for the most part, there's really amazing bipartisan consensus. It's it's almost the first thing we've all agreed about, I don't know, in about a decade. Um, I, have a, I have a theory about it, which is that, um, you know, if there's been this kind of somewhat false, well, very false cultural war in the U.S. between somehow mushy liberal values on the one hand and some kind of hard-edged patriotism or nationalism, on the other hand, one of the things the Ukrainians have shown us is that you can have a full-on patriotic, you know, tough defense of liberal values. 
And the president of Ukraine is showing us what that looks like. And I think there's a reason why it appeals to a lot of Americans. And when you when I think about Russia, I, you know, I think about who's going to come after Putin. I mean, it's probably going to be some KGB thug, just like he is. And people are like, we get rid of Putin. What are we going to have? Who knows? I'd, but when I think about it, I also think about this unbelievable guy, this guy, Navalny, you know, who, I, I mean, you've obviously had to have studied, you know, people like Sharansky, who sat in the gulag, people like Navalny. What, how do they do what they do? How do these folks, you know, they, and they know Navalny went back, right? He knew that it, when he went back, what they were going to do to him. What, how do they do what they do? It's funny. I've been thinking a lot about Navalny and I, I was planning to write about him. And then um, the war started and somehow the context in which I was writing needed to change. Um, you know, Navalny is somebody who is um, has spent a lot of time thinking about how to reach ordinary Russians, um, how to motivate people, how to what what are the issues, what are the arguments that can reach people, and I think his decision to return to Russia was partly about modeling what civic bravery looks like. Um, for those of you who are listening who don't know, what happened was that Navalny was poisoned. He was he's in he's the most prominent opposition leader in Russia. He was poisoned. Um, his supporters got him out of the country. They got him to Germany. They got him to a hospital where he was cured over many months. It has to be said, um, and he recovered in Germany. His wife and family joined him there, um, and then he made the decision. By the way, not only to return to Russia but to first create a video, an extraordinary video, it's a two hour long video, describing the um, corruption of President Putin and focusing on this ghastly, vulgar palace that Putin has built by the Black Sea. And Navalny made an elaborate video of it with all kinds of information that they got from people who had worked on it and so on. They put it on, he literally put it online and it went online as he was flying back into Moscow. And so when his plane landed in Moscow, first of all, there were supporters already at the airport. There were people taking pictures of him on the plane um, just because they knew what was going to happen when he landed. And he was arrested immediately as he landed. But he was doing that to show, you know, I really care. Here's what bravery looks like. You know, if I can do it, you all can do it, too. So and and this is the kind of involvement in public life he's been encouraging people to, to to do for the last decade or so and he decided that he had to show it himself that he he wouldn't by remaining outside of russia he wouldn't be able to show the russians how yeah. to resist their regime and then and by the way the return is controversial i mean if he were outside of russia right now for example he'd be a really really important voice in the war against ukraine so it's a in some ways a tragedy that he's not outside um, but the but this is a this is a this is a this is a commitment to changing Russia, and this is why he why he did that. I want to talk a little bit about uh, we're discussing here sort of crafting these narratives and what actually breaks through. And you had a recent article, uh, the reason Liz Cheney is narrating the January sixth story in the Atlantic, um, and you talked a little bit about. Um, you sort of framed, in, in some ways, the January 6th committee uh, of creating must-watch TV in a, in a nation that watches Netflix and binge-watches. Uh, we now have something that has cliffhangers, it has surprise witnesses. We're starting to learn how, somewhat effectively, to communicate to an audience at home who may be prone to turn this off. I'm curious to see, do you think it's having an effect? And also, what do you see the downside of our shifting uh, narratives or our narrative styles being? So the, the most important thing about the January 6 hearings was that almost everything that was said was said by Republicans and not just Republicans. It was said by Trump Republicans. I mean, OK, Cheney, Liz Cheney is is not a Trump Republican and she was really the leader of the of the hearing. She ran, you know, you know, essentially the Democrats handed it to her and had her run it. Um, but most of the witnesses, with a few important exceptions, but most of the witnesses were people who had worked for Donald Trump. Um, and so I think the idea of the hearings was to was to 
show in the least partisan way possible. In other words, to use the language of people who worked for Trump and 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 have that reach people. And then, as you say, secondarily, they also decided that the traditional format of hearings, which remember is a format that grew out of, you know, I don't know, 18th century parliamentary politics and, you know, dates back to an era before television and certainly before social media, that it wasn't working. It wasn't going to reach people in the same way, that people aren't used to watching um, a congressional hearing or a congressional committee meeting in the way that they're used to watching you know, video clips and, and, and a constantly changing narrative. And I, and I, I, I actually approve of that change. Um, I think it's, um, I think it would be really important actually for politicians to think, and really for us to think about reforms to the, the congressional process, you know, so that politics doesn't seem so alien to people so that it's somehow, um, events are happening, you know, take place in a, in a, in a, in a form and in a, in a, in a, you know, in a setting that people find recognizable. Um, and that doesn't mean it has to be superficial. I don't think the January 6th committee was, was a superficial presentation. Actually, it went quite deep. There were, you know, a lot of nuanced points made and so on, but it was, tr they tried to do it in a way that people would find easier to access and understand. Um, and maybe there's a broader lesson for um, politicians more generally. You know, if you want to communicate with people, you have to use the language that they use. Um, and um, I'm not a communications expert, and I don't want to tell people how to run their political campaigns. But it's a it, it might be a useful lesson for the future. You know, uh, one of the things that concerns me, Anne, is that it seems as though if you want to raise money. If you want to get elected, you have to go to the extreme. You have to get attention. Do you think there is a way for the middle to be interesting? <laughs> or is it human nature that, you know, we we don't really care for the middle. We really want the extremes because that's, that's – you go to a race, the car race. People say they go to a car race. You want to see a crash. You go to a boxing match to see a, a knockout. I mean, but is there a way in your judgment that we can make the middle um, – very interesting. I feel that that's my question for you. <laughs> I mean, it's um, it, it should be possible. You know, there were aspects of Joe Biden's presidential campaign that I thought were very interesting. I watched several of his ads um, and there were one or two of them. There was one in particular that I remember that was about work and family. And it sort of showed ordinary people commuting. They were going on a train or they were going on a on a bus or they were walking to work. And the, and the narrative was something like, I don't remember it word for word, but it was something like every day you go to work, you know, you why are you going to work? You're going to work to take care of your children, to take care of your family. Um, and then they showed, you know, pictures of children and families and so on. Um, we know what motivates you and we want to help you, you know, make it easier for you to do that and easier to take care of people. And it was quite moving. And I mean, maybe just a touch sentimental, but it seemed to me that the nothing language of with, that. Nothing wrong with that. But you're, you're with hitting that. on what I said earlier, which is people are not really interested in all your tax plans and all that other stuff. They want to know, do you do you get them and do you care about them? Right. And it sounds what you're describing. And that's why I think Biden, you know, the Democrats finally said, we're not going to win with anybody else. We better go with somebody who is in the middle and uh, yes. and, uh, and make people comfortable. Because, you know, you don't want to go to a doctor who's way out there on the extremes. You want to go to one who's got a lot of experience and can do a good job. But I think making the middle itself, communicating, if you look online, right, it's all this wacky stuff that people put on there. It's extreme stuff. It's nothing in the middle. And I think it's up to all of us to figure out how to make the middle interesting. And maybe it's connecting with people at that very basic level. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I think, uh, you know, it, it just requires some different level of creativity. Um, yeah, it does. You, yeah. And you, you can't sound like a Washington bureaucrat. You know, you can't, you have to, as I said, use the language and images and media or social media that most people now see th through which most people see the world. Yeah. But I think people can be moved by ordinary messages um, and by feelings of strong sympathy and so on. So, and, and there are, 
um, you know, there are positive emotions that can link people as well as negative. I mean, the negative emotions are maybe easier and quicker to, to come up with, but they also repel people. Um, and so I, I, you the know, difference I between think... negative populism and positive populism, positive yeah. populism, where you sit and sit down with somebody and say, I get it and we'll work together. Negative populism, where you're blaming somebody else, which is the which is the way that Orban and, and a lot of demagogues operate. The reason you got problems is somebody else took your stuff and po positive populism is, yeah, you're really hurting, but let's figure it out. Yes, I mean, this is a side issue. I mean, one of the issues is that the nature of modern social media, for a variety of reasons, encourages emotion and anger and division simply by the way the algorithms work. And um, that's a longer conversation for another time. But yeah. um, it's not a, it's not it's not so much that the social media needs to ban people or take stuff down. I, I, I think that's the wrong way. But thinking about how all those algorithms work and which kinds of emotions and conversations are being encouraged is is something that we should all be interested in. But but yes, I, you're right. I mean, I, I you know, there are Look, I mean, through history and th through American history, you know, we've always had presidents who bring people together by inspiring them and who, who make inspiring, unifying speeches. I mean, you know, I mean, you can talk about Lincoln, you can talk about Obama, you can talk about, um, you know, Eisenhower, FDR. I mean, there it is, it's not it was an it's a nonpartisan skill. Both Democrats and Republicans have been able to do it in the past. Reagan, of course, if, if they can just get an inspiring, thoughtful speech down to a 15 second TikTok with some sexy editing <laughs> uh, and lean towards moderation, our democracy is going to be fine. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, That's right. Well, and <laughs> great summary. In a nutshell. <laughs> well, Anne's newest book, Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism, is available now wherever you get books. And visit anapplebaum.com for more. And thank you for uh, giving us your insights. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Jordan here, uh, your favorite host of the Kasich Klepper podcast. Thank you for listening this far. If you like what you hear, click like or thumbs up or whatever icon signifies a positive reaction. We love your ratings. We love your thoughts. Reach out to us on social media. Let us know what you want us to talk about because I'm tired of answering the governor's questions and I just prefer to answer yours. Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon. Kasich and Klepper is a production of Treefort Media, hosted and executive produced by John Kasich and Jordan Klepper. Treefort Media's executive producers are Kelly Garner, Lisa Ammerman, and Matthew Kuglin. Line producers, Oscar Guido. Associate producer, Lee Albanese. Audio direction by Tom Monahan, head of audio for Treefort. With production and editing by Maxwell Carney. Sound editing by Abigail Sullivan. Talent booking by Blythe Asher. With additional production help from Tim Schauer, Haley Mandelberg, Lindsay Whistler, Colin Motel, and Anastasia Ibrahim. This podcast is powered by ACAST.